everybody. Um, it's 11 o'clock. Um, I can see there's a few people joining and keeping joining, but um, I think uh, I'll, I'll make a start and uh, say good morning. I hope everyone's got their coffee ready. Uh, I've got mine. So um, I'm going to uh, hopefully just talk for a few minutes about uh, how I got involved in, uh, in racing also give you a little bit more background to me because obviously I don't have a very long pedigree in the racing world and uh, so uh, it just might be helpful to understand a little bit of my sporting past and interests in racing um, and then um, hopefully you will all feed in some great questions uh, that I can answer that, that will make this much more of a dialogue between us um, it's a bit funny sitting here uh, in the heat, um, I've got my fan beside me, but um, uh, just speaking to myself. So please do pass through any messages and questions and, uh, and morning to, to all of you who are here already. Um, so again, thanks very much for joining. Um, thank you for race, to Racing Welfare for inviting me along. Um, my, my background in racing properly probably only started a little over a year ago. But uh, like many people, um, racing has sort of touched in and out of my life over a long period of time. Um, I, I have an Irish background. Both my parents um, emigrated to, the, to England in the 1960s, as many did. Uh, but my grandparents uh, lived there for a long time. And I spent most of my summer and Christmas holidays um, over in Ireland, either with them in Dublin or down on our family farm down in um, Camolan in Wexford. Um, which actually is very close to uh, to Willie Mullins and, and to a number of yards over there that I've visited since. Um, and I, I did a bit of pony riding when I was little. I used to muck out stables and in exchange I was given free riding lessons. Um, but then when I got to 13 and really wanted some cash, um, I'm afraid I, I stopped my pony riding and went to work in a greengrocer's um, stall and a greengrocer's shop uh, near my parents' house. Um, to earn some cash and I guess that's where I, I probably really got to hear about the Grand National most of all because it's such a ubiquitous event. Um, two, the two of the biggest days when you work in a, in a market uh, down near London will be the Boat Race Day and Grand National Day uh, when everybody has a position, everybody is supporting somebody and it brings huge excitement to the population and to the community there and I, and I think that's one of the great things about uh, about racing is is the community that it is and that it creates for other people and um, when people get behind a, a particular horse um, and uh, from my sport of rowing you know you're either a light blue or a dark blue um, so I uh, if I go back to my sort of sporting career I took up rowing um, when I went to uh, university in my second year um, so I didn't really do very much sport. I played a bit of soccer and I um, played netball and hockey and things like that, but none of them terribly well in my first year. I spent a lot of time uh, being very sociable in the bar, probably. Um, racked up an enormous uh, a bill for my, <laughs> for my drinking and did pretty poorly in my first year exams. And at the end of my first year, my uh, academic tutor took me aside and said, uh, I think you really ought to get some structure in your life. Can I propose a very high risk strategy, but um, suggest you go down to the boathouse and try rowing. That might give you some structure and help you to focus. Um, and at the risk of being thrown out of university, I, I took up his advice and took up rowing in my second year and, and really enjoyed it. Um, I rowed in the university women's second boat in my third year. And then when I left university, I came down to London again. Um, I worked in the art world. That was my sort of dream job from when I was at school, um, working in an auctioneer's and um, Philip's son and Neil. And um, I ended up rowing at a club uh, with a girl who had aspirations to go to the World Championships. And so I went with her to trials and got selected uh, for Great Britain in 1991 and um, in the lightweight four. And I had a great four years uh, racing and rowing and training um, in all of that. And I um, eventually decided that actually we, we were quite good as a lightweight four uh, and probably better than our Olympic team. So there were no lightweights in the Olympics in those days. And um, 
I decided that I would like to go to the Olympics, uh, set my mind on that and, and finally did that in, in 1996 in Atlanta, um, which was an interesting Games. Um, I guess that the interesting thing about it, having been a lightweight, so I, those of you who have been jockeys will uh, will understand um, and I can empathise with the weighing in and the dieting business. We, we would have to weigh in two hours before we raced um, and we had to have a crew a crew average of uh, 57 kilograms um, and no individual in the crew could be more than 59 kilograms and uh, if one of us was a bit heavy the others would have to sort of be a bit lighter to to allow for that so we spent a lot of time on scales uh, a lot of time uh, thinking about what we were um, how much we were drinking um, and a lot of time thinking about nutrition and uh, what weighed the lightest uh, we, we had a theory that you could eat ice cream the night before a race because it only turned to water and it wouldn't make you put on weight overnight so we had a tradition of um, chocolate ice cream with chocolate sauce the night before a race and it always did us quite good we usually raced quite well the next day I'm not sure it was good for us in the long run um, but um, when I was at university I'd, I'd met a very good friend of mine whose father was complete national hunt devotee um, so Mike uh, Schoen um, owned a number of horses and uh, had partnerships in a number of horses and Melanie and I would go with him and, and their family racing um, a fair amount uh, during those times and, and particularly afterwards when Melanie and I uh, bought a flat together and we raced and my, my I guess my favourite story is that uh, in 19, I think it's 89, um, he had two horses that he had entered for the Grand National and um, the ground I think in 89 had been, had been very dry if I remember rightly and he decided that he he was going to sell one of the two horses and his trainer in the end uh, advised him to sell Little Paul Vier because the ground wasn't going to suit Little Paul um, on Grand National Day and of course the day that he uh, decided to sell Little Paul Vier it started to rain and of course uh, those of you who who know um, the story will know that Little Paul Vieira went on to win in 89 and I think Mike knew from the moment the rain started that uh, that, he, that uh, he was going to win and uh, he put enough money on on Little Paul to make sure that he didn't lose out too much um, but it was it was quite an interesting lesson and quite an interesting to see how that for me from outside of racing how that worked. Um, since since I um, retired from from rowing, I've worked in sport either on a voluntary capacity or in a professional capacity in a number of different ways. And um, I uh, was asked to uh, immediately. I, I retired um, as an athlete. I, I stayed on and worked on a voluntary basis within my national governing body in rowing. And um, uh, ran the Women's Rowing Commission and got involved with their safeguarding policy and welfare policy and, and in the end became uh, the deputy chairman in charge of governance. So I oversaw the policies and things like that, but particularly around the introduction of safeguarding, which in the early 2000s, um, it seems like not a very long time ago now, but, but it was a whole different world um, in sport. People really didn't understand or think about uh, the welfare and well-being of individuals in sport in the same way that we do now and um, it certainly wasn't structured in any way um, so I, I was involved with writing our first policy and setting up our procedures and, and all those sorts of things um, and um, I, as part of that I then became uh, deputy chairman and, and on the board of the British Paralympic Association and uh, worked a lot in disability sport which was hugely rewarding um, but also quite shocking, um, you know, it surprised me that uh, quite a lot of those people with disabilities who historically had been sort of sidelined by society um, and who I, I really hadn't sort of come across numbers, large numbers of people that had impairments before, but just how gung-ho they were, how keen they were to be involved in sport and in dangerous sport um, because they tended to be people who 
if they hadn't been born with an impairment, they, they had their impairment because they had been doing risky things. They loved risk and they loved to be, um, uh, you know, try, trying new things and putting their life on the line almost. Um, and it was a real eye opener. So I, I really enjoyed my time working in Paralympic sport. Um, and uh, after that, uh, when I'd done my nine years there, I, I went on to the board of the British Olympic Association. So as an Olympian coming coming back into my own sort of territory um, and still and still deputy chairman there and, and would have been otherwise I would have been in Tokyo um, about this time but uh, obviously that's hopefully just been postponed and and will happen um, next year um, so my my involvement with um, horse racing really I, I had applied to be on the board of the BHA about five or six years ago and didn't get uh, didn't get a place at the time um, but having had the experience of uh, working with British Rowing both as the deputy chairman of governance and then as chairman for five years and um, uh, restructuring our governance there and uh, the various things that we've done um, having then um, taken on chairing the independent review into British cycling um, and looking at the the issues around harassment and bullying there. Um, some of you might remember the stories of Jess Varnish uh, in I think it was 2015 early 2016 um, when they were trying to qualify for the Olympic Games and her then coach um, told her to go off and have babies you know she would be better off not bothering um, and she went straight to the media and it became a bit of a media storm um, and uh, uh, given that I'd had uh, experience working in disability sport as well as uh, safeguarding and was heading up a governing body of a similar sort of size um, I was asked by UK Sport to put together a, an independent review panel um, and uh, that was quite interesting that that resulted in quite uh, drastic changes at British Cycling um, with uh, the board uh, all being um, moved on, uh, the senior staff being moved on and, and quite a lot of reform happening there. So with those, all that experience um, and different, different sort of aspects of it, when the, the role for uh, the British Horse Racing Authority came up um, a year and a half ago or two years ago, uh, I was approached uh, to see if I wanted to apply for the role and, and having had um, thought about that before and having had the experience I had and you know I just thought well I'll, I'll give it a go. Uh, I seemed to have the experience that they wanted and um, they said at the time they wanted somebody who was independent and from outside the sport with a fresh look um, and who wasn't from any one of the particular groups of people within the sport and um, I, I applied and uh, got the role as you know. Um, I've had a fantastic uh, first year, really enjoyed it. Um, it's challenging, um, it's a sport that has um, a lot of challenges, lots and lots of different ideas and groups and views, but you know that's part of what makes it great. There's an awful lot of, uh, uh, awful lot of expertise, uh, there's an awful lot of knowledge and there's huge heritage and, uh, and history in the sport. Um, I'm really optimistic about uh, what we can do with, with racing um, if we all pull together. I'm sure we can make this a, a great sport and an even greater sport um, than it already is uh, and it has so much to offer to people um, and you will all know um, how tight the community is. You know it's one of its great strengths is the, the tightness of its community and how close um, the community is. Uh, so I, I've really enjoyed it. I guess one of the things that um, surprised me most uh, about um, about becoming chair of the BHA have been the number of people that I already knew, people within the sort of circles I already know, who after the announcement said to me, wow, fantastic, what a great role. I love horse racing. And these are people I thought I knew quite well. Um, and I was really surprised and struck by the number of people who love racing but don't talk about it very much. I mean, if I get into a taxi in London, a 
a taxi driver will almost always ask you what football team you support or what your views are on certain aspects of sport. But none of them ever ask you about horse racing and yet most of them are really into their horse racing. Um, I'm a, uh, on the court of a, um, it's not really a livery company, but it's a London company, like a sort of trade association uh, for watermen and lightermen. So it's really the river operators, the taxi drivers on, on the river um, that are part of it. And uh, the, the morning that the announcement was made, I had a meeting at the hall and, you know, all of these people that I knew really well were just full of discussion and talk about racing suddenly. Um, and it struck me that, that there's an awful lot of people out there who really are huge supporters, but don't talk about it enough. And one of our big challenges is, you know, to make people who are not within the very close racing community um, want to be part of um, racing, want to talk about it and be associated with it. And if it's something we can make people really proud of, to be associated with, you know, then we can ensure that, uh, that there are corporate sponsors out there who want to be associated with racing and, you know, more and more. So we, we need to make racing really much more broadly acceptable. I'm just looking at some of my, my questions here. So Amy, National Hunt or Flat? Um, I, I would say historically I came into racing or came to know about racing through Mike Schoen and Melanie, my friend, um, and they were big jumps owners and, and fans of jump racing. Um, my first Cheltenham was in 88, I think, um, and I remember much against the advice of my hosts, I backed Charter Party um, in the Gold Cup. And of course, Charter Party went on to win, which and I, it was, I can't remember exactly what the odds were, but they were, they were reasonable odds. Um, so, you know, I love, I love jumps racing. I love the excitement of it. I love going down to the fences um, and, you know, we used to go down and watch the watch them going over the jumps at the fence. It's a fantastic atmosphere and those sort of thundering of hooves. Um, but over the last year, I've really become to um, come to love the flats as well. Really enjoyed some of those races and um, some of the horses, particularly uh, on the flat, are fantastic. Um, Enable, of course, I think everybody loves. But um, Batash, I, I really like Batash. I've met Batash a couple of times. And, um, and it, you know, he's just a great horse, always, always very welcoming. And for a speed horse, you know, really quite relaxed, I think. Um, I've really enjoyed feeding him a few polos um, over the last year. So, um, so I guess, favorite horse in training? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Gaiath, I, I quite like at the moment. Um, Batash, as I say, has been a great horse. Um, and Blue Point, I loved Blue Point while he was racing. Um, that was uh, trying to think about some of the jumps horses um, now. I'll have a think about that one. Um, in terms of favourite race courses, I think we have got some of the prettiest race courses. Um, I, I always thought that rowing had the best stadia. Um, we have some beautiful, around the world, there are some beautiful places where you can have competitive rowing, um, particularly in Central Europe, some of those beautiful lakes. But I do think that our race courses in the UK are just fantastic. Um, I love Cheltenham. I love the bowl of Cheltenham looking out um, at that. Uh, Goodwood, of course, has to be one of the most amazing views from Goodwood looking out across the Downs. I mean, it's just beautiful. Um, but also Beverly. Um, and some of the smaller race courses are lovely. And in terms of race courses to go to, York um, is wonderful. Um, you know, I, I think they're all, they're all, they're all, they're all really fabulous race courses. Um, and they all have some heritage and history. I'm, I'm, I guess, perhaps from my art history sort of background, um, I love the history of the buildings and the grandstands, and that bit always kind of. You know, even even the Newcastle. I love Newcastle because of that, and and those buildings and the stories about the houses. Um, uh, I have been um, I have been racing overseas. Um, so I was in um, I went over to the Ark uh, last year, which was my first visit there, 
but I was in Hong Kong. Um, actually, I was in Hong Kong to watch our coastal rowing world championships um, last autumn. And I took the chance to go to Sha Tin uh, to watch the racing there. And that was a fantastic experience. I mean, you know, they have a wonderful setup there. Completely different, obviously, to here. Very much living in a bubble. Um, I do. I do feel having been out and watched, you know, the horses that we have here on the gallops and being able to be turned out into paddocks and, you know, the sort of space and the air and everything they've got, I do slightly feel uncomfortable about three story stabling and, and having all geldings and, you know, out there. But but what a great atmosphere and what a great sort of setup they have in, in Hong Kong. Um Sha Tin was interesting. I, I spent four months there on training camp when I was in the GB national team for rowing and we went to Sha Tin to watch the racing um, and uh, and to Happy Valley occasionally during those four months because it was a it was a it was a great outing um, the national rowing centre is right next to Sha Tin uh, race course so it was really easy just to walk across there um, and but that's changed quite a lot since um, uh, so uh, I, I, I don't know I could say I've got a, a very favorite race course but um but I love I love all the different the variety of them and uh, all the different uh, places that there are um, so I've also got a question about um, what surprised me about the role at the BHA um, gosh uh, I think I was reasonably well prepared for for, for the role at the BHA uh, in terms of the process I went through and the people I spoke to ahead of coming in to it. Um, having been involved with governing bodies a lot, uh, you know, governing bodies are not there to be best friends with anybody and regulators are never going to be hugely popular um, with those that they regulate. That's part of the job. Um, and I guess it's not really my job to be best friends with everybody it's my job to try and make sure that as a governing body we steer a path to help the sport find the best most sustainable way uh, and the most prosperous and uh, successful way forward um, and to engage and to use the expertise that's already in the sport so there wasn't much I was surprised about I think probably one of the things that surprises me about racing as a whole is the number of organisations and the complexity of decision making um, that there is. It, it's quite, uh, I don't know another sport that is quite so, uh, I don't want to use the word divisive, I think fragmented, you know, into lots and lots of different organisations. So it's quite complex trying to make change and reach everybody. It's not an easy process. and. Um, you know th there are lots of layers uh, I think it's in some ways that's great in other ways that makes it quite difficult to um, to manage uh, things and to manage change and to get consensus over change and um, so that that's that's something that's different to other sports um, and it's something that we just have to try and constantly evolve and constantly improve um, I think. Um, I was talking about um, people, um, uh, people who I know who uh, who I've learnt um, like horse racing, um, and just wanted to share a little uh, story. I was with my father-in-law yesterday, who's 88. He'd fallen over and came to stay with us for the day while he iced his knee, and um, he told me this fantastic story of uh, how he had when he was 12. Um, decided he, he was a great racehorse fan as a youngster and he'd got into racing when he was about eight or nine um, and when he was 12 he, he sent his father off to uh, place a bet um, on the derby for him or I think it was 1944 so he was 12 in 44 and, and he bet on Ocean Swell and that's his his great sort of favourite racehorse of all time and he, he, we were talking about today and he shared that with me so just wanted to to share that that story that that everybody's got a you know a tale to tell about a great race that they've backed um or a great race that they've 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 thought about and watched and that they really remember um and i suppose mine 
will be and I, I hope my son I brought him to watch uh, the King George last year and that amazing race between Enable and Crystal Ocean I'm sure he will he'll take that with him um, it, it's been wonderful to watch my kids uh, have the opportunity to learn about a new sport over the last year and they, they'll all have their own favorite horse um, and certainly uh, my middle son who's at Newcastle um, and will occasionally now having taken him there on their first weekend up there last year um, a huge fan of Lost in Translation so um, so there's some there's some great uh, you know there's some great work going on to try and uh, encourage youngsters um, to uh, become fans of racing and to come into racing um, so I'm just looking uh, at the questions here. Um, BHA looking to extend the flat season this year. Um, I'm not sure, it, possibly a little bit, but I, I can't really comment on that. Um, uh, but, um, but certainly we're being as flexible as we can because of COVID and trying to, if anything, concertina things in. Um, it's quite difficult to make vast changes to to the program to extend it and um, but we'll we'll certainly look at uh, how we can keep some of the things that have improved the season this year and um, and make those uh, make those better um, I am just thinking about other racing stories that uh, that I know that I can remember from my past and my 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 grandmother was a uh, bit of a racing fan as, as was my grandfather on my mum's side actually and um, she would always go to Phoenix Park and to Leopardstown um, and, it, and it's really sad to see the closure of some of those race courses. Phoenix Park I think was a was a great race course I remember from when we were little um, popping out there quite occasionally in the past. Um, a particular race horse that captured my attention throughout my lifetime. Um, Christina, let me have a think about that. Um, I, I guess, you know, from somebody who wasn't in the mist of racing and sort of picked it up over the great race days uh, when I was younger, Red Rum was of course a horse that everybody knows and everybody, you know, ha had in their heart, I guess, at the time. Um, other than that, I think probably the two I've already mentioned, um, Charter Party because he was my first big win and Little Polvier because of the personal sort of connection and that story of watching the horse that your friend's father has just sold win the Grand National and miss out on that amazing moment um, or we'll always put little Paul in our sort of you know in our hearts as it were. Um, Rod hello uh, nice question from you um, which leaders in sport and life inspire inspire me um, I think probably the most inspirational people are the people that you know um, the people that have sort of touched your life uh, my predecessor at British Rowing was a lady called Dame Di Ellis and Di um, had been a both a cox and a rower in the 1960s and she was chairman of British Rowing for um, 24 years in the time when you could just keep on being re-elected um, she was my immediate predecessor and she was an um, amazing lady. She was a really good listener. Um, she was fairly inscrutable. She could very hard to tell what she was thinking, uh, but she was a really good operator and she um, would always encourage people. So she would pick people out and sort of help steer them through, um, steer them through, uh, you know, difficult pathways help get them into the right place to help support uh, either British rowing or the sport um, she certainly tapped me on the shoulder a few times and encouraged me to take roles that I didn't think I was ready for I think um, particularly as a woman sometimes you need that push you need somebody to say you can do this you know off you go and um, in terms of in terms of broader I think people like Barack Obama you know what a what a what a leader and what a sort of um, strong person to go out there and and do what he did and and he really was sort of I know he was controversial in some bits but but what a great leader for for the U.S. to have had um, and and sort of helping that inclusiveness 
um, being able to talk about his life uh, and things like that. Um, but I think probably Di would be my, Di, my grandmother, you know, people like that are the people that, uh, that I mostly think. Um, Dawn, just going to follow up with your one. Do I feel the challenges of engaging girls in sport and fitness impact on their progress as jockeys? Yes, absolutely I do. Um, I think we don't work hard enough with girls at a young enough age at all to keep them engaged in sport. And we see this with the British team as well, um, in the Olympic team. Girls are socialised not to do sport at a very young age. They're allowed not to. Boys, everything about a boy's life. And I have two boys and a girl. My two boys both row regularly. They're both extremely competitive. My daughter gave up rowing when she was 15. It's too easy for them to give up. It's really hard to keep them engaged. Um, and if they don't do that, then they very quickly don't develop at that critical teenage age the core strength that they need. I mean, there's a physical, it's not just a mental thing, it's a physical thing. They really need to be engaged and they need to be competitive because so much of sport is about the mindset. Um, and, you know, one of the things we found in rowing and in Olympic sport is if you don't have people around you who are chasing you and competing with you and making you hardened to that competition and that sport, um, then it's much harder to build that in at a later stage. You can have all the fitness you like and everything else, but if you don't have the competitive mindset, um, then it's much harder to be successful. And I think with girls, that's just not something that's at the top of people's agendas, whether that's uh, school um, or, or at home as parents or just in the sorts of things that girls are, are given. So I do think there's more. Um, and we see it with our Olympic team, actually. For Tokyo, we will have uh, the first time we will have a, a British team that has pro probably more women than men as athletes. And our worry is that our women in this country are not as good at converting to medals. So our women, no matter how good they are and, and how fit, they don't always convert to medals as well as the boys on the team at, uh, at Team GB. And, and we need, you know, we need to work at that, but it's not something you can necessarily deliver at the last minute. It needs to be built in. And I'm sure that um, if we could engage more girls and keep them fit, then when they get to the British Racing School or the, uh, the National Horse Racing College, or you know, into their pony racing, they would have the fitness and the strength because I'm, you know, I don't know quite enough about about um, jockeys' strength and conditioning training, but I'm pretty sure that their core uh, has got to be critical to it. And um, just watching what they do, so I think you know, there, there is more we can do at, at school level and at encouraging girls. Um, I do still row. Um, I uh, I row very irregularly. I try and run um, as much as I can to keep fit but I've, I've actually damaged a tendon in my shin at the moment, my calf at the moment, so I'm off off running. But um, I do uh, row whenever I can if I'm ever given an offer. Um, usually in a, in a boat with a bunch of old ladies like me. Uh, we have veteran masters rowing um, for anyone that's, anyone that's in rowing is over 27, um, is, a, is called a master. Um, which is a bit bizarre, uh, but um, I, I do array with a bunch of women who used to be national team rowers, um, who were we're all we're all great in the past, uh, and if we go out now very occasionally and have a nice outing, uh, we don't get very sweaty. Uh, we make it we make it fun, um, but we do have plans. We we had plans to go to uh, to Boston in the U.S. to race in a big regatta there. Uh, which would have been this October, and um, sadly um, it was cancelled because of coronavirus. Um, but um, I do, I do keep that up, and I, I love it. Um, it's great fun. Um, well, we're we're kind of at the end of our our thirty minutes um, at the moment. Unless anyone's got any last minute uh, questions, um, I want to say thank you very much to you all for joining me this morning. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, and uh, please do, you know, if you see me out and about, please do come and say hello um, and talk to me and tell me your thoughts. 
um, because I am I'm, I'm really keen to hear from everybody um, in the community and the racing community and thank you all very much for anybody who has um, a joined us today but but who's also made me feel very welcome um, in the sport as a new sport and as an outsider coming in over the last 12 to 14 months thanks very much then bye bye <laughs>